Can we bow down our head in prayer so that we can commit our worship this hour into the hands of the Almighty? Holy and precious Father, we have come again to be fed by you. Precious Father, we pray for the teaching power of the Holy Spirit this hour. We pray that may Holy Spirit open our eyes to the truth of your word. Help us to see what you want us to see. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. And help us to apply that which you have revealed to us. That by so doing, we bring you glory. Father, once again, I want to lift up Reverend Moses before you. Thank you for the missionary work that you have done through him. I pray that you bring him back to us in sound health, replenish his strength. Thank you for being there for his family. We pray that may you continue to uphold them. Father, we pray that you prepare every heart for this message. As you have ministered to me during the course of preparation, may you now minister to your people who are inching to hear you speak. May your Holy Spirit speak through me. To your glory, for pain, Jesus. Amen. Like I said last Sunday, I will be doing or I'm doing a series on the church, on the study of the church age. Today I am still on that series, but I'll I'll be handling an important aspect of that series, which is the unifying purpose of God in creation is the glorification of himself. The unifying purpose of God in creation is the the glorification of himself. We have two tests that I want us to look at as we approach this topic. The first test is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Please join me in open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It's a popular passage, but still, open that place. Paul, third Timothy, to be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. Some other translation will say study to show yourself approved. But our own translation here, which is the one I'm having, which is the New American Standard Version said, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately, the word of truth. You and I have been called to be diligent. In in order to show ourselves approved unto God, which means our first responsibility in life is unto God. Before you start thinking about somebody else, you are first responsible unto God. Why are we going to, why, are, why should we be diligent in presenting our self approval unto God as it relates to this topic? Let's see First Peter 
chapter 3, verse 15. We are going somewhere, guys. First Peter 3, verse 15. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 reads, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Every minute, wherever you find yourself, you are either supporting God's work or you are disproving God's word through your utterances, or through your character. That is why the first place we read said, be diligent to make yourself approved unto God. And this passage that we just read in First Peter says that we can defend the gospel. You and I have been called to defend this gospel. The question is, how do you defend what you don't know? How? Before you can defend something, you must have known about that thing. But in this context, it's the word of God we have been called to defend. I'm going somewhere. But I want this to sink first. You carry this Bible. Some of you have been believers for X number of years, but you don't know the content of the Bible that you are carrying. And yet you call yourself a believer. And when you hear some certain things, like the one I'm going to mention to you very soon, you don't know if it is true, or you don't know if it is falsehood. You just take it, a man of God, a pastor, a servant of God, a believer, a brethren have said it or said it, and that makes it accurate. You don't know what it is anyway, so whatever they tell you, it's true. But today, I want to challenge us. I want to encourage us. If you don't have a Bible, get one. It is God's manual for our life. If you have one, study it. Peter just told us that we are called to defend it. In order to defend it, we need to study it, live by it, and be able to say, when we hear of error, this is falsehood. That is sound biblical teaching. So, let's see today's study. I have an objective for teaching this message. And the objective is to unfold the biblical truth consigning the glory of God as the unifying purpose of creation. That's my objective, so I want you to have it off hand. Have it at the beginning, let it sink that. What is the purpose of today's teaching? God's the glorification of glory of God is the purpose of God in creation. Okay. Now, let's see why I wrote this message. There is a group of believers called Covenant Theology. This group asserts that God unifying purpose in creation is the covenant of grace. That sounds wonderful. That sounds to be truth. 
But if you look beyond the statement, you will see that there's some mistruth in it. Because we know what grace is. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For grace you have been saved through faith. So who will now start disproving that? So at the surface level, that is true. But let's look at beyond the surface now. They said, this is the covenant that God made with man after the fall, in which he offers salvation through Christ. In other words, the covenant of grace is God's plan of salvation and the unifying purpose is redemption. That means everything that God did from the beginning of creation till the end is all about redemption. That means there's nothing else apart from salvation of mankind. Like I said, from surface value, that is correct. We have been redeemed, we have been saved. By the time you and I place our faith in Christ, we are saved, we are redeemed. But is that all about it? Is that all that the purpose of God in creation is all about? Let's read further, or let's study further. The, according to them, the responsibility of the church is to Christianize, is to Christianize the world. That means to make everybody in the world a believer. That's good. That's why we preach the gospel. But let's keep going. To them, there will be only one judgment. And that judgment will come at the end of the world, when the whole world has been Christianized. You see, it begins to change. We know about the rapture. The believers will be judged for the world at the Bema seat of Christ. We know about the judgment of, that will happen at the time that Christ will come during his second advent. We know about the final judgment, the judgment that all unbelievers will be judged according to, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. But these people put everything together and say there will be one judgment. And that judgment is the one that will occur at the end. So what are they driving at? According to them, there is no rapture, there is no tribulation, and there is no millennium. See what I just did? But like I said earlier on, if you look at the beginning when I started that it's it's about redemption. We all believe that God has a plan of redemption. But that is not all that God is all about. Redemption is part of his plan, but that's not everything about God. The purpose of all these things was what? To prove that there is no future for Israel. That is the aim of all these things they are doing. Because if you believe in rapture, that means there will be a tribulation after the rapture. And if there is a tribulation after the rapture, there will be the millennium of Christ. And that is where Christ will fulfill all the promises that God made concerning Israel. And these folks said no. So what did they do? They spiritualize every passage that deals with Israel by trying to find more spiritual meaning into those tests and eliminating Israel from the picture. But on the other hand, or however, most Bible Scholars believe that God's unifying purpose is the glorification of himself. God's unifying purpose in creation is the, unif is, the unif is the glorification of himself. For example, God is a consuming fire. 
Hebrew 12, 29. Let's see there. Now we start flipping Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. So, as a consuming fire, the consuming fire nature of God reveals the, 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 the judicial aspect of God, not his redemption purposes. God is a consuming fire, as a consuming fire that reveals his judicial aspects. God does not joke with sin, he judges sin. And that's also why those that have followed Satan in rebelling against God, in not believing in Jesus Christ, we find their eternity in lake of fire. That is part of God's plan. That those that do not believe in son will go to hell. So is that all about redemption? The answer is no. Okay. God has revealed himself for the purpose of, glorific- for the purpose of his glorification through one general revelation. Creation as we know it reveals God for the purpose of God's glory. Join me, open your Bible to Psalm 19, verse 1. Psalm 19, Psalm 19, verse 1, read. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. The heavens tell of the glory of God. And their, their expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Creation talks about the glory of God. Let us see 2 Corinthians 4.15. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 reads, For all things are for your sake, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause, may cause the giving of thanks to, the abound, to be abound to the glory of God. Everything that God creates is for his glory. There are other Bible passages that you read at home. Philippians 1.11. Philippians 2.11. Philippians 2, so try and read those places at home. Secondly, special revelation. The center purpose of special revelation is the glory of God. The central theme of God within that purpose is his reconciliation plan. And the central character is Christ. Scripture, which is the Bible that you and I read, is a special revelation. And that special revelation points towards Christ. The Bible points to Christ. Let's see John 5:39. Please open your Bible with me to John chapter 5, verse 39. John 5:39. You search the scripture. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is this that bears witness of me. Scripture, as a special revelation, points to Christ. And Christ, as God's revelation, reconciles man back to God. The purpose of God in special special revelation is to reconcile us back to himself in order that his glory may be seen. So, you see that in um, God's revelation of himself through Jesus, John 1.18, can we open John 1.18? John chapter 1 verse 18, please. 
John 1, 18 reads, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained God. You see, Christ is the revelation of God for what purpose? That he may, re that he may reconcile man back to God. Let's see 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. I'm going somewhere, guys. Just bear with me, okay? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. See, in Christ, he was reconciling the world to himself. The purpose of our salvation is that we should be reconciled to God. When Adam sinned against God, there is a break in relationship. At any given time that somebody believes in Christ, that person is reconciled to, back to God. So, the purpose of God in creation of man is that we bring him glory. But that glory was truncated when Adam sinned. And in our salvation, we are being reconciled back to him. Okay. Let's see another dimension. How can we be sure that the glory of God is indeed his primary purpose for creation and not redemption? How can you and I know that the primary purpose of God in creation is actually his glory? Are you going to take it because I said it? Or you want to see biblical proof for that? Just like the covenant theology says that it's all about salvation. Okay, let's all see biblical proof. Number one, God said he created us for his glory. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Please open your Bible with me. That is how you can actually say, you saw it. He is not lying. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. We can go home from here, but we are not. You see, God said it himself. Everyone who I created for my glory. He didn't say who I created for redemption. Everyone who I created for my glory. Like we already said earlier on that, God reconciled back to himself through the work of salvation that we may glorify him because that is why he created us. Number two reason. Salvation is to the praise of his glory. Salvation is to the praise of God's glory. Ephesians 1, 5 to 6. 12 and 14. Let us see these places. Salvation is to the praise of God's glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of his glory. See there? You and I, we are saved to the praise of his glory. Let us see verse, in the same chapter, let's see verse 12. To the end that we who were first to hope in Christ 
should be to the praise of his glory. Lastly, verse 14. Who is given as a pledge on our inheritance, a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own, prop, God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. This verse 14 is linked to verse 13, which talks about the Holy Spirit that is given to you and I. Okay. So, this means that redemption is a means to an end, and that end is what? Glorification of God. Jesus said something in John 17, verse 4. Let us see that, please. I don't want you to quote me at the end of the day. Just quote scripture, because I am of no authority. John 17, verse 4. Jesus said, I glorify thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. Jesus is speaking here in respect of the cross. He's praying. He was praying about going to the cross. The purpose for his coming is to glorify God through the cross. So, redemption is a means of glorifying God. It's not the end result. The end result is glorification of God. But redemption is one of the means. Okay. Thirdly, or number three, God chose Israel in order to manifest his glory through them. God chose Israel in order to manifest his glory through them. Let's see Isaiah. Isaiah 49.3, excuse me. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. Isaiah 49, verse 3 reads, And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Why did God choose Israel? To manifest his glory through them. So if you say that it's all about redemption, the question you ask yourself if God chose Israel to manifest his glory through them, what happened to his plan for them? Because if the plan is all about redemption, after they are saved, what next? There is a purpose why they are saved. There is a purpose why God chose that nation for his glory. You and I as a believer are mandated to do all things to the glory of God. We are mandated to do all things to the glory of God. Let's see 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Remember, before God can demand anything from us, he has to save us first. And he saved us when he presented Jesus for us as a means of salvation, which is redemption, and we believed it, we are saved. Now he's asking us to do everything to his glory. Because salvation is just the beginning of our spiritual journey. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
You are here to glorify God. I am here to manifest God's glory. But guess what? I have to be saved first. Because the Holy Spirit who enables us to glorify God is only given to believer. After I am saved, I cannot live the right Christian way of life and bring God glory. So salvation is not the end result. The end result in your life, in my life, as a child of God, is to glorify God. Number five. Most Bible scholars believed God has a plan for angels. And those and those plan does not involve salvation. Because none of the angels, whether holy or fallen, experience salvation. So when you say it's all about salvation, how about the angels? Remember when we talk about general revelation, the Bible says, all the heavens manifest your glories. And those angels are in heaven. So, you cannot limit everything that God does in history to just salvation. The end result is the glorification of himself. Because what about the angels? If you read your Bible very well, you will see the roles that God used angels to play through history. And we don't know the other part that God did not reveal to us. So therefore, it is not all about salvation. Okay. Although the Millennium Kingdom, the Millennium Program involves salvation, God's purpose of glorifying himself in creation will be fulfilled in the Millennium. All the promises that God made to Israel will be fulfilled in the millennium. Everything that God made that was supposed to be fulfilled in Adam that was not fulfilled will be fulfilled in the millennium. Whatever it is, think about it. There will be perfect environment in the millennium. Christ will reign as a king in the millennium. Although salvation, that will be salvation in the millennium. Because at the beginning of the millennium, all unbelievers will be removed. Christ will start with a perfect environment. And then children will be born through the millennium by the believing parents. Some of those children will not believe in Christ, while some will. That is why we said that there will be salvation in the millennium. But guess what? In that same millennium, the church age believers will participate. We will come because the Bible says we will reign with Christ. Okay? So if it's all about if it's all about redemption, we have already been saved. Glorified, we have gone to heaven, be judged, and we come back with Christ to reign. So if it's all about if it's all about salvation, are we going to be saved again? No. Salvation is a one-time thing for anyone. So it is not all about salvation. It's all about God's glorification. And that will be Manifest in the fullest during the millennium. So, the covenant theology that says there is no future for Israel, there is no um, tribulation, there is no rapture, 
when they come to passages that talks about these things, I wonder what they are thinking. That is why you and I need to study this Bible. Excuse me. So that you will discover for yourself what the Bible is actually saying concerning these things. And when somebody comes to start telling you things that you know are not true, either you open the Bible to tell them, to show them, or you tell them what you are saying is not true. I don't believe it. But what if you don't know? How will you know what is true or not? Like I started in the beginning, when I said the seed is all about redemption, and we all know that God has a plan to save the believers, and we all know that it's not everybody that will believe in Christ. So if you all know all this, and somebody is telling you, oh, at the end, the purpose of the church is to make everybody believers. Even they say no, that not everybody will believe, because they said, oh, that will be a final judgment. But the key thing this morning, my goal this morning, is to awaken the desire in you to seek after the truth of the word of God so that you will not be led into falsehood. Okay. I have three applications. Three reasons why this study is important or I'm, why this study is important. Three reasons. Number one, covenant theology denies God's plan for Israel thereby making the Holy Spirit a liar. As the author of scripture, the Holy Spirit states through many passages that Israel has a future in God's program. How do I know that the Holy Spirit is the author of scripture? I don't want you to quote me. We have two passages to that effect. Number one, 1 Peter 1.21 and 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's open 1 Peter. First Peter One verse 21. Sorry, Second Peter 121, don't mind me. Second Peter 1 verse 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke from God. You see, the 66 book of the Bible, we are written by God the Holy Spirit, like we just read, through those that God chose to write them. The Holy Spirit moved through them to write what God wants us to do. Let's see 2 Timothy 3.16. How did he do that? Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. All scripture is inspired by God. Our scripture is inspired, is inspired by God. So when the Holy Spirit moved in the mind of the writer, according to the place we read in First Peter, in Second Peter 1, 21, what they wrote became the word of God. 
The men we are not inspired, but the words we are inspired. God spoke to them. The Holy Spirit breathed into them and they breathed out the word of God for us. And that which they gave us become the inspired word of God. That's why he said, all scripture. He didn't say all writers. All scriptures, we are inspired by God. So, for anyone to now say, oh, those passages that relate with the future, concerning the rapture, concerning tribulation, concerning the millennium, are not true. You know what you just did? That person just made the Holy Spirit a liar. And God lied. The answer is no, God cannot lie. If God cannot lie, then we or whoever is doing that is a liar. Because we are opposing God, the Holy Spirit, who has given this words to us. Secondly, every believer is responsible for glorifying God with his or her life. You are responsible for glorifying God with your life. I am responsible for glorifying God for my life. Why am I saved, Ojo? Oh, I am saved so that I will glorify God. Why are you saved? You are saved so that you will glorify God. You are not saved to live your life the way you want it because what? You are heavenly guarantee. I'm going to heaven anyway because what? Christ paid for it. So I am heavenly guaranteed. But God demands you and I to glorify him. We have two passages to look at. 1 Corinthians 6.20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Excuse me. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Read. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Why did God buy you? Or why did God bought you? That you will live the way you like? Do the things you want to do? Say whatever comes out of your mind? With no regards to God or to anybody? No. According to this passage that you will glorify God. Can you ask yourself a question? Last Sunday we were here. In those 11 reasons that I gave why we are going to study the church age, one of them was glorifying God. Can you ask yourself from last Sunday to today, did I glorify God or did I live for myself? In this forthcoming week, that today is the first day of the week, how am I going to live? For myself or for God? God saved you. He bought you so that you can glorify him. The second passage is the place we read earlier on. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Did he say do some? He said do all. You eating, you drinking, you walking, as in doing any kind of walk. You even taking the stroll at the park. To the glory of God. That's why the purpose of God in creation is not redemption. You have been saved, so redemption is completed. 
Now, glorify God. Are you? Will you? That's a question to answer for yourself. We glorify God when we learn and apply his word. When we obey his word. When we trust him with all our hearts. When we love him with, um, with love that cannot be compared or shared with anything. Have unwavering faith in him. Live a life and live a life of humility before him. You want to glorify God. You have to make sure that you study this word and apply it. Like I said in the beginning, you cannot apply what you don't know. Spiritual life is not lived in a vacuum of what I think, what my grandmother told me, what my grandfather told me, what my teacher told me. No. You must devote yourself to studying and applying this book. Remember what Paul, what um, Moses told Joshua, or what, sorry, what God told Joshua after Moses is gone. Joshua 1.8. This book of the Lord shall not depart from you. You shall meditate on it day and night and do it, after which you will have success wherever you go. You want to have success. This book shall be part of you. You study and learn, apply the God's word. Not just to apply it. You have to learn to obey it. Do you obey the word of God when it pleases you? When it's in your favor? Or at all times? Even it will cost you your work. Do you? Or do you say, I must stand with the truth of the word of God. Even if I will lose my job. Will you say that? Do you trust God? That he knows your life, he created you, he knows you, and you are here for the place of his glory. So whatever your life will turn out to be, it will actually bring his glory. And you will allow him to live his life through you. Do you trust him? Or do you trust in your own ability? Do you really love him? Or you love him when everything is going good and well for you. But when things are not going the way you expected, you begin to say, this God, this God, I don't really understand. Maybe I am not doing the right thing. Or maybe I shouldn't be doing it this way. Start thinking of alternative B as a way of living the Christian way of life. You have an unwavering faith, unwavering faith in him. Is your faith strong in your God? That even if they said, if you are a believer, cross this place, you are going to die. You are willing to cross and die for God. Or do you start thinking otherwise? Maybe if I live longer, I will be able to serve God. Let me just deny him for now. Yes, let me just deny him just for now. And I said, I thought you were a believer. Cross. Mm. Yeah, maybe. I don't really know about that God. Because you want to do it. We need to know what we are doing. Lastly, God saved us to manifest his glory to others through us. Remember what I said earlier on? It is not all about salvation. 
It is all about his glory. And because you are saved, you have a responsibility. One of that responsibility is to live to honor, to glorify him. The other one is to manifest his glory to others. I don't need you to preach to me about Jesus when you cannot exemplify him before me. To God's glory, everywhere I go, I don't identify myself. I just told them, my name is Ojo. And when I start doing things, they said, are you a child of God? I said, did you see that? And they said, maybe there's something unique in how you do your things. And then they will go further. Are you a pastor? I said, who told you? Because I don't want want to be the one preaching my gospel. What if I come to you and I say, I'm a pastor? And I just did something. Say, huh? Is he really a pastor? How can he be doing that? We shouldn't be the one calling ourselves name. Remember, in Antioch, the believer did not tell the Antioch people, hey, we are followers of Jesus, call us Christian. No. The Bible said they observed and said, this one have been with Jesus. They are Christian. Your neighbor is observing you. Your colleague at work is observing you. The people you meet at the grocery store are observing you. If you are a spouse, your wife is observing you. Your husband is observing you. Your parents, your children are observing you. Your children, your, if you are children, your parents are observing you. And guess what? Whatever they see as a product of observing you is what they used to make a case against you and your God. The end result is not you. Remember, it's all about God's glory. And you can be a source of mockery to God. When somebody say, if that is how it is to be a child of God, I don't want to do one. You just spoil everything. But if somebody say, like one of my colleagues say one day, he said, I, I don't really understand this Christianity, but if I want to go to church, I'll go to Ojo's church. And I said, what do you mean you don't understand about this Christian? Have I not preached to you about Christ? He said, yes, you did, but I'm not yet ready. But the time I'll be ready, I'll go to your church. I said, why? He said, because you have exemplified your preaching. So, because of our time, the following passage you can read at home. Matthew 5, 15. It says, like light, shine. That when people will see your light shine, they will glorify the God your Father. Matthew 5 15. 2 Corinthians 2 14 and 15. We manifest God to the world by evangelizing the lost. We all have been called for that purpose. Matthew 28 verse 19, the Great Commission. Go into the world and make disciples. We also manifest God to the world by allowing the Holy Spirit to produce his fruit through us. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. When they see all these things, they give glory to God by, oh, I want to believe or I want to have what you have. Use the opportunity to give the gospel. Brethren, I'm about to end this message. But I want you to examine your life. While we are doing our opening prayer, I said something about a lady that passed away yesterday at my job. This lady died of cancer. Before she died, they wrote um, eulogy about her. Let me see, I've already prepared her death before her death. She was not showing any sign of pain or discomfort or regret of anything. Each time you come to her room, she's reading her Bible, always telling people about Jesus. 
listening to music, gospel music. And when she died, few minutes after she passed, I went to the room. And her daughter told me the book. She said, this is my mother funeral message. And she opened the last page. She said, look, my mother was a missionary. She lived her life to serve God. And then I looked at her. I said, that is the reason why this lady was so peaceful during the time of exit. And I said to myself, how do I want to exit this one? In regret? In sorrow? That all my years in this world, I leave it for myself. I live to give myself whatever he wants. Excuse me. <coughs> that is self-gratification. I never give a minute to think about God and ask myself the ultimate question. <coughs> Why am I here? <coughs> Excuse me. Self-glory or God's glory? The ultimate question I want to leave with all of us this morning is the question of why am I here? If this should be my last minute on earth, what am I leaving home with? How am I going to appear before God? No one is assured of the next second. None of us. We can be going here now. I may have a wreck and die. No matter the good things or whatever you may say about me, the question is, what is God going to say about me when I come before him? That is what hit me when I look at that woman yesterday. And that's what I want you to take from this message. Am I glorifying God or am I glorifying myself? Can we burn our head as we pray? Father, thank you for this message. I use this opportunity to invite everyone who heard me, but yet have not made the ultimate decision. You see, everything you heard me say this morning will not make any sense to you if you are not a believer. Salvation is the beginning, is the beginning of spiritual journey. That's why Paul can tell the house of, Cornelio, house of uh, Philippian Taylor, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Paul told the house of Cornelius, of him, whoever believed, received the forgiveness of sin. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him will have eternal life. It is not whoever believe and promise not to sin again. <clears throat> it is not whoever believe and confess his sin. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it is just whoever believe. Brethren, if you heard me and you made that simple decision in your soul, whether you verbalize this or not, so in I believe that Jesus is Christ and his death on the cross paid for my sin. That alone qualifies you to be a child of God. That alone guarantees you of eternal, of eternal salvation. I want to congratulate you. You have done this. Okay. Chairman, can I please close us in prayer? Almighty God and Father, we come before you with thanksgiving for this, for this beautiful day that you have included us in, part of your plan, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together at this place you provided for us, to be taught your word, to immerse ourselves in your word for 
this time a refuge from the, from the world, Father. And you are worthy. You are worthy of the praise and the glory that we are charged with each and every day, the purpose for our creation. Father, you have provided for us redemption, salvation through the work, the plan that you made for Jesus Christ to die on the cross, rise from the dead, Father, to assure our salvation. And Father, as we go out this week, we may be closing this, this service as given together, but the praise of your glory continues each and every day. I pray, I pray, Father, that we would call to mind the words we have been taught today that we have listened to from your scripture. Fulfill, Father, your plan for us each and every day. And Father, we do so in anticipation of meeting again to continue to grow and study your word. If that be your will, we pray that we meet again next Sunday. We ask these things with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.